This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Now let's get to the charts. Now listeners, you'll find the download link for the post-game chart deck in the research roundup email. And if you don't have the research roundup email, it means that you're not yet registered at macrovoices.com. Just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com and click on the red button over Rory's picture that says looking for the downloads. Nick, let's get to talking some of these charts. Uh, I I know you've been uh, watching this S&P in the reactions in this uh, post-inflation number. What levels are you watching here? Yeah, that was quite a move, Patrick. Uh, We saw inflation come in lower than expected. And the S&P, as I speak, is up about 4%. Tech is up about 4% as well. So looking at the November 11th spot uh, OPEX for tomorrow, the uh, spot right now is 38.60 on SPX. I expected to move for tomorrow is about 60 points in either direction. So it's about a 1.5% move either way. Uh, upside would be around 39.20, downside around 3,800 or so, which is right where support would be now as that was previous resistance, right? So um, given that we've broken above this level, if we keep on running the upside today and we see a break of 3,900 or so, we should see a push toward 4,000, which is a key level of resistance. So the bulls may be in control right now. We got to wait and see what happens today. But uh, that's my thinking on the markets for today on SPX. Now, Eric, what are your thoughts post-inflation here? My only strong conviction is medium to long term in the sense that I don't think the final bottom is in. And I still think there's plenty of bad news to come for both markets and the global economy. But from now to end of year, I really have no idea. There was what seemed to be a good setup for a rally into year end that seemed to have fizzled after the last FOMC. The news could flip it again back to the upside, so I really don't have any strong conviction. This morning's CPI print definitely spiked the market higher, but it remains to be seen whether that upside momentum holds through this afternoon's close. So my view is I have really, frankly, no idea what comes next, but I strongly doubt that the final bottom is anywhere close to being in for the stock market. Well, you know, Eric, in principle, I agree with you. It's just not enough evidence to know that we're uh, not out of a bear market. But uh, one of the things that I've been looking for is, you know, if there was just uh, any scenario that was uh, alleviating the stress on the market, whether inflation coming in lower, uh, you know, one of the arms of the government flipping Republican, all these kind of things would give a short term tailwind to this market. With today's uptick uh, in the post inflation number, uh, I'm actually thinking we clear that October high. Uh, I feel that uh, in the coming weeks, there's a legitimate chance we're going to to see the 4,000 level, which is a, a FIB level that we're, we're watching closely. And uh, under the right circumstances, maybe even a, a rally into the holidays where we could be even going back to August highs is all possible. Now, even though I may have a slightly sh- uh, short-term bullish view, uh, I still think that 2023 is going to have some serious obstacles that leave uh, more bearish downside risks. Uh, but you know, what right now technically we can only trade what's uh, the most immediate short-term trend and i feel that that generally the s&p 500 edging higher particularly if it has the gusto to beat 4,000 on the upside, could really neutralize the sell cycle we've been in for most of the year and allow things to be stable, at least into the year end. Nonetheless, uh, I wanted to move on to page three, uh, where we have the chart on the VIX. And Nick, I wanted to talk to you about this because I'm actually a little bit surprised. We were going into elections. We were going into this inflation number, which is considered pretty important. And yet the VIX kept crawling lower under 25 for a little while Uh, it's uh, here we are sitting still around this area but i thought at least that we were going to see some higher volatility uh in anticipation of these numbers now that it's got a bullish tilt we could certainly see some you know further vol contraction but uh what what are you thinking here in terms of the levels on volatility yeah, it was very surprising looking at the VIX and watching it move post-election. But uh, my thinking is that we haven't seen it 
spike because we haven't seen the outcome of the election yet, right? Uh, it's too close to call right now, and it may be that way for the next month or so. Uh, as I speak, spot fix is 23.72 roughly, and that denotes about 1.5% moves each day. Now, the funny thing is, is last week I mentioned the expected move to the upside and downside on uh, SPX, which is the VIX is predicated upon. Uh, they're out of money options. And yesterday we were almost at the same point we were at uh, last week. So we basically didn't, didn't move for an entire week on SPX. Now we've moved higher a bit. And obviously the VIX is down today, about 10% already as I speak. But I do expect it to pick up and support is heavy at VIX uh, 20 roughly, right? So looking at the chart for the year, the support is very heavy at around VIX 20. But again, if we see a move to 4,000 on SPX and above, the VIX should die down toward that level, at which point I may go long VIX. Now, moving on to the US dollar on page four, Eric, has anything changed in your thinking? Until this week, to my eye, the chart was showing a sideways consolidation in the range between 110 and 114 on the dollar index. Now it's starting to look like a new gently downsloping price channel is forming, but it's still early to make that call decisively. So my outlook is flat to lower in the short term, but news events could easily force a change of direction. Now, Eric, I, those two levels so, uh, are certainly important. Uh, for me, though, I look at the bigger intermarket significance of the dollar index. The dollar rising throughout the majority of the year has been a huge pain on almost all risk assets, and it's been dragging everything lower. And one of the biggest questions to continue to ask is, have we seen an intermediate high of the dollar? And I don't want to say major high or a major reversal, and it's all downside for the dollar. But if we just see the dollar stop rising, and even if we see mean reversion back towards even a midpoint where like during the summer, we traded down around 105 to 108. If we suddenly seen the dollar just backing off, not crashing or anything, just backing off, it may be the tail when that risk assets need and particularly a number of these commodities that we're going to be talking about but that could also be that tailwind for the stock market that could see things uh, um, you know levitate higher into the year end one way or another the first reaction has been the dollar uh, weakening and this is certainly going to be very important for all the different risk assets we're looking at from here now patrick on page five we have the crude oil chart what levels are you watching here Okay, so let's let's talk crude. And one of the things for me here, obviously, Eric, is uh, you've been sharing with us all of the different things that you're observing on it. But uh, for me, I want to see a simple pattern emerge technically, the pattern of accumulation, pattern of higher highs and higher lows. And when dips like the ones that happened over the last 48 hours uh, occur, that we want to see buy on dip behavior immediately emerge and, and take advantage of the short-term buying opportunities. Uh, clearly, there's a substantial overhead resistance along uh, the, the 90 to 95 zone where all the highs of the second half of the year have all been. And it would certainly be quite technically significant if we broke out above that. But right now, the most important thing to watch for the remainder of this week go and going into early next week is will the bulls be able to reverse the selling of the last 48 hours? If they do and we get back up but in the 90s, um, that would, again, continue to demonstrate that characteristic of accumulation and something that I think that uh, is going to be really interesting. Now, what I really, though, wanted to do was move on to gold. Now, Eric... Uh, what are you making of the, the recent strength that we've seen in this breakout? First, the bear trend line that's been in place since the March peak has finally been decisively violated to the upside. So from a trend line perspective, we already have an upside breakout. Next, from a moving average perspective, the 55-day moving average has pretty much contained this market since March, with only small and short-lived excursions above the 55 uh, at the interim peaks along the decline. Now we have a very decisive break above the 55-day in the last uh, three sessions, but we need to see that sustained for a few more days before it's completely conclusive. The next hurdle to overcome from a moving average perspective would be the 100-day moving average at 17.23, and this morning CPI print just broke the market above that level. Finally, in terms of lower highs and lower lows, we need to see a daily close above 17.35, which would be above both the September and October peaks to confirm the pattern of lower highs has been broken. 
as we're recording just after the CPI data came out on Thursday morning, we just hit 1735. But the real test is going to be whether we can hold above that level through the close and then stay there. But it's essential to understand what I think is driving this sudden strength in gold and what could cause this newfound optimism to evaporate if the monetary policy outlook changes. I'm convinced that the reason for all of this sudden strength is pessimism about the economy is growing, and the view has become that hawkish monetary policy is going to break something, probably sooner than later. Inflation, on the other hand, doesn't appear to be going away, although this morning CPI print is a little bit of a miss compared to expectations. If it turns out that even after hawkish monetary policy breaks something, that the Fed still stays the course on rate hikes until inflation measurably comes under control, then this bullish optimism for gold may prove to be not wrong, but perhaps just a little bit early. Now, to be clear, eventually the Fed will break enough things that they'll be forced to reverse course on hawkish monetary policy. Inflation still won't go away, and the expectation of rapid rapidly falling real yields will be realized, and that's definitely uber bullish for gold. I'm just not convinced that this outcome is as close at hand as the market suddenly seems to think. Yeah, Eric, I'm looking at uh, gold a little bit more optimistically. Uh, I've really looked at it as a cross currency to that U.S. dollar. And what the U.S. dollar does next was going to be a really important part of whether or not gold was going to have some short term year end rally. I was looking for a fourth quarter rally. This is certainly a, a healthy start to it. What it really would uh, solidify this breakout would be a legitimate break above the October high. Uh, uh, get it north of 1750 and then see that pattern of higher highs and higher lows as old dips start being bought. If we see that, that will certainly pop gold up on everybody's radar and maybe allow it to have a strong finish for the end of the year. Obviously, we're only a few days into a rally. It's a very premature to be getting excited, but uh, it'll be really, uh, it's something to watch to really see whether or not uh, the bulls can build on this. Now, on the next page, you have a chart on copper. What are you thinking over here, Patrick? Well, it wasn't just gold and silver that moved. Uh, we saw a whole series of these industrial metals. Uh, arguably, you can see uh, everything from iron ore to, uh, to the different coal plays and all these different uh, basic material industrial metals are all also moving. Uh, obviously, thematically, it involves a, that kind of idea or speculation that inevitably China is going to be reopening at some point and, and uh, there's traders that may be wanting to front run that, but also the fact that the dollar is weakening is finally alleviating the pressure on these uh, commodities. Copper definitively put in a basing formation over the last six months. And so now that we're seeing it attempt to break above the August high, maybe a lot of these different types of um, commodity plays may actually start to bull run. It may not just be gold, but it might be an entire commodity complex rally. And that's certainly something uh, I think could uh, uh, potentially happen in here. On the last page, we have a chart of the 10-year yields. Now, what are your thoughts on these, Patrick? You know, interest rates here is really important because not only have uh, it was a deadly combination of a strong dollar and much higher interest rates that basically forced a complete repricing of risk assets. And so if we now see the reverse, where we see obviously the uh, weak dollar and subsequently lower yields and interest rates start to in any way back off as bonds uh, you know, rally from incredibly oversold conditions, this could be an environment that continues to also add further fuel to a potential year-end rally. Again, I don't want to get uh, uber bullish on bonds. I don't want to get uber bullish on stocks, but let's be, uh, let's put it into context. We've gone through a nine month shit show and the markets were an awful place to be in almost every asset class. And inevitably every trend has a counter trend period and things being so oversold as they are, us going through a one to three month counter trend rally would not be uncharacteristic of in this kind of oversold condition. And so with the yields now backing off, 
off as inflation has uh, come in at least in line to slightly cooler. Uh, that may allow all of the, uh, you know, the bonds to rally a bit, yields to come off. It'll be really interesting to see if it stays below 4% here and whether that sends it down to 35 to 375 It's certainly something to watch. Folks, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading. The details are in the last pages of the slide deck or just go to bigpicturetrading.com. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>